but we're happy to be here. My name is Charles Watson Jr. and I'm the Director of Education at BJC. And I am happy to have the Reverend Dr. J. Augustine with me tonight. How are we doing, hey, Doctor? Doing well, my brother. It's a pleasure to be with you, and thank you so, so much for having me, too. Thank you. So, so you're joining us tonight because you are the 2020 uh, Walter B. and K.W. Sheridan Lectures Lecturer, and uh, we're just happy to have you as a lecturer. If you don't know, the lectures will be March 29th and March 30th down in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Macon on the campuses of McAfee School of Theology in Atlanta, and also Mercer University and Mercer uh, Law School down in Macon. And so uh, Dr. Augustine will have three different lectures for us while we're down there. Let me give you a little background about Dr. Augustine if you don't know him. And uh, since 2019, he's been served as the senior pastor of the St. Joseph AME Church in Durham, North Carolina, while also being an adjunct or well, a law professor at the North Carolina Central School of Law. Uh, he is a graduate of Howard University, and also he gained his law degree at Tulane University. He also has a master's degree from the United Theological Seminary, and he also earned his doctorate from Duke University. And I would like to tell everybody he is a veteran of the United States Army. <laughs> we won't hold that against him. As proud a, to have served, Mr. Air Force. Proud yeah, to have served. <laughs> proud to, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Well, um, Dr. Augustine, we gave you a, gave a, a little background about who you were academically and your your, your many uh, degrees there. But could you tell the audience a little bit about who you are and how you would describe yourself? Thank you so much. Let me first and foremost say thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to all of our listeners for coming in or tuning in today. Uh, it is Black History Month, so we want to lift up a narrative of thanks for those who have gone before us, who have sacrificed so, so, so much. And since you elevated the military to a fellow person who has put their life on the line in defense of the most wonderful country in the world, I'm so thankful, uh, again, to be in community with you. Um, uh, based on what you said and what I know to be true, uh, there is never a dull moment, right? There is never a dull moment. Right. Uh, I am a pastor at heart. I'm a law professor at head and heart, right? Um, I love serving God's people. I love being in community and being there for others. Uh, I also love immersing myself in rich uh, 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 historic rulings of law that have made a difference in our body politic, uh, being able to share whatever wisdom I have gleaned over the course of more than 20 some odd years, 21 years uh, as a member of the bar, uh, uh, beginning a career after graduating from Tulane Law School as a law clerk at the Louisiana Supreme Court, uh, engaged very actively in litigation and civil rights work, much school desegregation work, uh, elected office, publicly elected office, gubernatorially appointed office, yeah. uh, uh, accepting the calling to serve God in ordained ministry and recognizing as the old saying is true, a calling to preach is a calling to prepare. So uh, preparing myself to rigorous academic training to give better service to, uh, uh, again, never ever a dull day, but I wouldn't have it any other way though. Uh, I love it. I love it. I love it. And like I say, it's just uh, even through all of that, I, I like how you say you're a pastor at heart and uh, a lawyer at head and heart. And so let, let's talk about those, those two dichotomies and how they work together and how sometimes they can, uh, some people may see them as, as working against each other. So I say that. So as a minister and a lawyer, um, how do you reconcile? How do you deal with the idea of separation of church and state? So the concepts for me really are, are very much apart, but at times they come together very nicely, I think, to complement one another. Um, when I think first and foremost about my work as a pastor, um, uh, as far as my heart is concerned and my intentions, I really was called to be a servant and pastoral ministry is the perfect outlet uh, for my natural desire to serve. It's a very special, special calling that I answered. Um, but when I think about that role and I think about ministerial leadership, uh, we typically look at and evaluate leaders in, in, in ministry under what's called the Munus Triplex Doctrine, or some people call it the threefold office. We look at the pastor as a prophet, as a priest, and as a king, or to put it in non-gender terms, as a royal, meaning someone leads from the royal domain. Uh, uh, the, the, the priest is someone who gives conciliatory leadership and goodwill in representing the institution in times of need. Uh, in, in my duties as uh, uh, supervising funerals, giving eulogies, visiting sick members in the hospital. That's the work of the priest, is conciliatory leadership. Uh, when you think about the, the work of the royal, 
uh, of course, balancing church budgets, uh, uh, organizing church calendars. We now have entered a season of strategic planning at St. Joseph. Uh, that is that is the work of the royal. That is the type of leadership where you say this is the direction the ship has got to go. Come, as the as Iron Mike the infantryman said, right? Come, follow me. Uh, but the but the work I really have been called to in pastoral ministry is the work of the prophet, and the and the prophet is one who uh, both literally and proverbially speaking speaks truth to institutions of power. Uh, so when we think about uh, leaders of years past and gone by, particularly as we lift up Black History Month, I can't resist calling Martin Luther King Jr.'s name. Classic prophetic leadership as someone who spoke truth to institutions of power. Uh, uh, to hold myself, to boldly hold myself in that image as a spiritual descendant of Dr. King's um, uh, over the course of the previous presidency, I'll say, without being overly partisan, just that time period in America's history, I found myself uh, speaking truth to power in, in, in multiple situations. Uh, uh, I found myself speaking out against governmental policies that I felt were unjust and not right, uh, uh, that, that disenfranchised that sought to marginalize and the like based on a variety of characteristics, be either ethnically, be it based on gender, be it based on race, but that is the work of, of the prophet in, 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 in full ministerial leadership. Uh, as someone who is a lawyer, and particularly someone who is a law professor, um, I have developed an acumen and an understanding of the importance of separation of church and state. I can go back and look at the importance of the pre-colonial documents or the colonial documents that went and infused to what the First Amendment would mean, meaning Roger Williams, meaning John Locke, meaning how those philosophers uh, uh, urged us to keep, not, not to repeat what had happened with the Anglican Church of England, not to repeat the back and forth that led to the English Reformation, but to make sure things were very separate and to give us not in 1776 with the formation of the country, with the Declaration of Independence, not in 1788, I believe, with the, uh, with the adoption of the Constitution, but in 1791 with its first amendment to that Constitution to say via two clauses, no establishment of religion and we must have the free exercise of religion. So I'm someone who can look at both sides of the spectrum and, uh, and I think understand and, and bring a sense of compassion to dealing with others uh, with respect to the issues. Thank you for that prophetic uh, word on that, you know, that speaking as, as the prophet, you know, uh, you can't get too close to one and still right. prophetically over it. Uh, you know, you make it do that with your family sometimes, but even it gets tough in your family when you get too close that you can't say the things that you want to say or need sure. to say. And so I, I often use that as a balance, you know, how, how it is to be in relationship with the church and with the state. Both of them have to have uh, the prophetic word on, on both sides of it. Yeah. There's got to be a balance. And I am, I am fortunate in North Carolina in particular uh, to have been appointed by the state's governor uh, to serve in a couple of capacities, uh, uh, committees that he certainly needs trusted leadership there. And I recognize that my leadership has been called on because of the trust I have earned as a clergy person. Um, I am serving on a social justice task force now, a committee uh, specifically since it's Black History Month to lift up HBCUs and, this, and the focus on fairness and equity there. And I serve in that capacity uh, as a member of the faculty at North Carolina Central University Law School, again, a historically Black institution. So uh, no problem with keeping the two separate, no problem with bringing the two close together uh, when need to be. I like that. Like that, and so you've you've mentioned uh, Black History Month uh, several times here, and we we're, we're happy to be acknowledging that, and happy to have you on the first day Black History Month. You also mentioned um, Dr. King, which is a uh, you know spiritually aligned and uh, just 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 a hero of, of freedom fighting. Uh, I want to know if, if anybody else you just wanted to hold up at, at, at this time, at this moment in, in Black History Month that uh, as either freedom fighter or somebody just inspired you um, in, in your life. Absolutely. Um, when I think about BJC, quite frankly, and I think about your rich heritage in, 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 in representing religious liberty and speaking to religious liberty to protect religious liberty, um, uh, I've got to think about what began as an unfortunate tale, uh, but, but is going on as a celebrated narrative. And that is the way in the African-American community, religious liberty led to uh, church-run institutions, mm. uh, meaning, meaning higher education institutions. So as a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, someone who's ordained and serves uh, in, in AME ministry, 
Um, I lift up the legacy of Wilberforce University. I lift up the living legacy uh, of schools that we have pushed to the forefront to provide opportunity for others. Um, uh, and, and in many cases, others who would not have had a chance to have opportunity. So when I think about that, I think about uh, the living legacy of Richard Allen, the first bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, since I lifted up education in particular, and thank you, by the way, for recognizing I'm a Howard University graduate, right? I'm very proud. And again, it's Black History Month. I should be proud of that. But I do recognize that Wilberforce has a strong claim uh, in history because of its uh, affiliation with my denomination mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and its significance. So um, as I think about education and Wilberforce, I lift up the legacy of Charles Harris Wesley, who I will also add, uh, gone to glory many years before, but my fraternity brother, a past general president of my beloved Alpha Phi Alpha and, uh, and a leader in the AME church and in education ministry. Um, um, to think about the Baptist brothers and sisters who have done so much for so many. I lift up the legacy of Adam Clayton Powell, a senior and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Freedom fighters, those who pre preach the gospel of religious liberty, those who preach the gospel of empowerment. So when I think about the narrative of Black history, it is such a celebrated narrative, uh, but it began as a, as a story uh, uh, that lacked hope, but God infused hope and we're so thankful for the, the, the way people have fought for religious liberty and lifted up institutions. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I, I second all of those names and, you know, throw, throw Prathia Hall and Fannie Lou Hamer in there. And it, it, it's, Call the roll, as they say, right? Call the yeah, roll. Call the roll. It's, it's so many. And, and sometimes we um, see this as 28 days, but uh, it, it, it is American history. Um, there is no American history without Black history. So uh, calling right. those roles is something that we all should be proud to, to do and, and want to do uh, at, at, at all times, not just in February. So um, I mentioned that you're going to be doing three lectures down in, in Georgia, my home state. And so I'm, I'm happy to, to, to have you there. Um, you'll be doing uh, uh, some preaching, being able to do some preaching at a the chapel at McAfee. You'll be speaking to the undergrad students in, in Macon and also the law students in Macon. Can you give us a little preview of, of what those who get to register for the event? Again, um, you, you can be in attendance if you're going to be down there in Georgia registered for that event. Uh, could you give us a little preview of what, what's in store for everybody that gets to, to hear you? Sure, sure. So I am I'm really so excited and thankful for the opportunity to be with you. Um, as I think about, about the, the role I play as a minister and how I attempt to make uh, a, a text that is, that is much, much older than I am, obviously, make that text that's timeless, make it come to life. I think about an old saying from a theologian, Karl Barth, who used to say, the preacher should preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Uh, now, I, I say that just sort of sort of metaphorically to reference uh, our time and the day in which we live. In order for the lectures to be timely, I believe they got to focus on uh, an issue that is that is of great importance at this time in 2022. Um, as I think about the state of affairs in our government, we have been led and, and, and misled by a narrative of Christian nationalism. Uh, that is not about a theological orthodoxy or it's not about conformity to certain religious beliefs. It's about the politics of us versus them and the vilification of anyone who does not fit the narrative of, uh, um, in many cases, straight white Anglo-Saxon Anglo -Saxon Protestantism. Uh, and regrettably, that narrative is playing out uh, with attempting to deny the right to vote. Uh, it's playing out in state legislatures with voter suppression legislation, uh, it is praying out in a in a post Shelby County v. Holder world uh, 2013 Supreme Court decision with changes uh, uh, to balloting places, polling places that inherently disenfranchise many, primarily minority voters. Uh, it is it is playing out with redistricting and, and the fights we're seeing, including in the state of North Carolina, where I am now, uh, over over congressional districts, over realignment of state legislative districts. Uh, so we are seeing Christian nationalism on full display, and I and I want to. If my name was Webster, and the next issue of the dictionary that came out when when someone looks that term up, I would show people climbing the Capitol on January 6, 2021, as as poster exhibit A. So regrettably, we are seeing how religious liberty has been perversed, infused with uh, uh, the old civil religion, as they call it, of wrapping the flag, or wrapping the cross in the flag, uh, and now Christian nationalism has run amok. 
and, uh, and democracy, the very fiber of our society is really at issue now. So I hope to bring a lecture together that is multidisciplinary, uh, one that will look obviously at history, uh, one that will look at theology, will be undergirded in some regards by theology, one that will look uh, at the law, one that will look at sociology, and one that will also look at political science to talk about how uh, people have come together for certain alliances and in the, in the inherent identity politics we play in America, but again, how we can fight against things that are, are, are uh, prohibit the true exercise of democracy. And, uh, and Christian nationalism is one of, the, one of the things that really is high on my radar that does exactly that. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I would say, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be able to speak to a, on an interfaith forum in a couple of weeks here. And uh, one of the titles of, of, of my the part that I get to speak on is, uh, you know, um, the doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, Christian nationalism, mm. <laughs> nothing new. Wow. Wow. It's, it's the same thing all the way through. Uh, right. And, and we're, we're actually just going back to those things. Um, with, and um, um, BJC has a book club right now, and we're reading uh, the book Unsettling Truths. Uh, one of the authors is Mark Charles, and we were able to do an interview with him um, last time. And so uh, with, with book club on my mind, because after I finish with you tonight, I'm jumping into that book club. Uh, I want to uh, give you a chance to talk about uh, your newest book, um, Call to Reconciliation. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about it? And uh, we'll probably show it in our, in, our, in our chat there where you can where you can purchase it. But uh, please take take time to, to, to thank you look and, and talk about it before us. Thank you so much. It is February 1st. And in honor of Black History Month, the book's official release date is February the 8th. So one week from today is the official release date. Pre-orders can be done. The book will be in your hand February 8th, called to reconciliation, how the church can model justice, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, Baker Academic is the publisher, and I am so, so excited about the contents and the message. Uh, for me as a minister and as someone who obviously is immersed in law, I unpack reconciliation in a threefold context. Uh, from the Christian perspective, reconciliation is salvific, it's social, uh, and it is also civil. Uh, uh, and the, the latter has less to do with the church and more, much more to do with secular society. Let me, let me give a visual. Uh, Dr. King often talked about the cross, the Christian cross, having two planes, the vertical plane and the horizontal plane. The vertical plane would represent, in the Christian context, the individual's salvific relationship with the divine, right? Individuals are saved through Jesus. That is the context of salvific reconciliation. But individuals are also equal to one another, a valid, very egalitarian ethic that we find in Paul's epistles. Individuals are equal to one another because of Jesus. That would be social reconciliation. And the narrative of civil reconciliation really means if we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal, then all must mean all. And mm -hmm. all means oftentimes the prophet must speak truth to power by organizing, by engaging in civil disobedience, by taking it to the streets, literally, uh, uh, but by holding government accountable to make sure that there is freedom for all people and they have an opportunity uh, to live peacefully in the United States of America. That's the context of civil reconciliation. We have attempted to do that in America in very imperfect ways, but we've attempted through this social experiment to bring people together in community where they can grow with one another, where they can learn with one another. Uh, one of the analogies I use in the book, and I begin the book by talking about gumbo. Let me pause to give a shout out. I'm from New Orleans. I'm not from Cincinnati, but I'm rooting for the Bengals because of that quarterback, because he played for the LSU Tigers. That's right, because of Joe Burrow played for the LSU Tigers. But as a, as a native of Louisiana, as a proud native of New Orleans, my favorite food on the planet is gumbo. And I'll tell you why for the context of diversity and inclusion. The difference is with the old melting pot. The melting pot that we use to talk about Americans, uh, people coming into America, it, it presupposes a, a, an assimilation to, to, to assimilate and to, to fit into the mold. I understand there are rules. I understand there's a social contract. I understand there are certain ethics we've got to follow. I get that. But the gumbo, you can look at gumbo and you can see that's the shrimp. 
Mm. You can look at gumbo and see that's the chicken or perhaps the hen. You can look at the gumbo and see that's the okra, that's the sausage. Those things are not in competition with one another. Those things are not fighting against one another. They're complementing one another, representing their individuality, representing their individual identity, but still coming together to make something that is wonderful in community. That is the concept of diversity that I lift up in the book, talking about both cognitive diversity in terms of our training and our thinking and identity diversity in terms of how we self-identify, straight, black, gay, white, whatever the case may be, uh, uh, how we come together and create community and learn from one another and make society better. So that is call to reconciliation, how the church can model justice, diversity, and inclusion, Baker Academic is the press. Wherever books are sold, I encourage you to get one, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Oh, no, no problem, Doc. You made me laugh. I, I you know, you threw, threw in your uh, Louisiana roots. I got to throw in my Georgia roots, and uh, <laughs> I'll be rooting against you. Oh, uh, look out. Because the quarterback of the Rams went to the University of Georgia. Yes, he did. So, yes, so he did. Him. Yes, he did. And uh, I like your gumbo there, but, you know, I, I use it with grits. All right, my, my all right. She cooked grits, and she, when I used to eat meat, which is funny that I don't, she, she probably, if she was alive right now, she'd just look at me crazy, because I used to eat my grits with cheese, she would cook fish for me, she would uh -huh. cook bacon for me, and she would have here shy form uh, beef sausages, and my, none my, of those my. things were competing with each other, they all do You understand. Dinner. You understand. <laughs> in there. So I understand where you're coming from with that, Doc. And uh, I appreciate your time tonight. I appreciate the fact that you're our lecturer this year. Again, that's the 2022 uh, Walter B. and K.W. Sheraton Lectures down at uh, Mercer University in Atlanta and Macon, March 29th and 30th. Please go ahead and register now. Um, and, 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 and as Doctor said, please go ahead and grab that book. Uh, we might make that our for the year. I make that one of our book club books a, as well. So, awesome. uh, Doc, I, I want to say thank you again. And any last words for for those uh, uh, listening in attendance? It is just a pleasure to be with you. Um, more than anything, religious liberty, I believe, is about creating community where people have the opportunity to be themselves whether they choose to believe or not to believe, but to be free and to prosper. America has now reached a place where there's got to be conformity. Otherwise, it's us versus you. And that's not the America we want to live in. So I encourage everyone to support organizations like BJC. It's a delight to be in community with you. And I'm just so thankful for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Augustine. And for everybody else, just remember faith, freedom for all. It has to be all. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.